Ambante tisranena pancha silani yachami dutiampi ambante tisranena sa pancha silani yachami tatiampi ambante tisranena sa pancha silani yachami Namota sa bagavato arahato sama sambuta Namota sa bagavato arahato sama buddha Namota sa bagavato arahato sama sambuta Namota sa bagavato arahato sama sambuddha sa Namota sa bagavato arahato sama sambuddha sa Namota sa bagavato arahato Amma Sambuddhasa. Buddham Sarvam Gachami. Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Sangham Saranam Gachami. Sangham Saranam Gachami. Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami. Dutiyampi Dhamma. Dutiampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Dutiampi Sangham Saranam Gachami. Dutiampi Sangham Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Buddham Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Buddham Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Sangham Saranam Gachami. Tatiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami. Ti Saranagamanam Mititam. Ama Bante. Panati Pata Vimatia. Panati Pata Vera Manisika Padam Samadiami. Adina Dana Vinisika Padam Samadiami. Adina Dana Vera Manisika Padam Samadiami. Kami Sumicha. Chara Vipadam Samadhya. Kame su mi cha chara vera manisika padam samadhyami. Musava da vera manisika padam samadhyami. Musava da vera manisika padam samadhyami. Sura me raya manjapamada tana vera manisika padam samadhyami. Sura me raja maja pamada tana vera mani sika padam samadhi. Imani pancha sika padani si lena sukatingati si lena bhoga sampada si lena nibutingati tasma si lami sodhaye. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. 144. Chanawada Sutta. Advice to Chana. 1. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Sariputta, the Venerable Mahakunda, and the Venerable Chana were living on the mountain Vulture Peak. On that occasion, the Venerable Chana was afflicted, afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. Then, when it was evening, the Venerable Sariputta rose from meditation, went to Venerable Mahachunda and said to him, Friend Chunda, let us go to the Venerable Channa and ask about his illness. Yes, friend, the Venerable Mahachunda replied. Before, then the Venerable Mah Sa Sariputta and the Venerable Mahakunda went to the Venerable Channa and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down at one side, and the Venerable Sariputta said to the Venerable Channa, I hope you are getting well, friend Channa. I hope you are comfortable. I hope your painful feelings are subsiding and not increasing, and that they are subsiding, not their increase is apparent. Friend Sariputta, I am not getting well. I am not comfortable. My painful feelings are increasing, not subsiding as Sutta 143, paragraph 4. Their increase and not their subsiding is apparent. I shall use the knife. Note 1307. This is an elliptical expression for committing suicide. Okay. Then, sorry, but I have no desire to live. 
Let the venerable China not use the knife. Let the venerable China live. We want the venerable China to live. If he lacks suitable food, I will go in search of suitable food for him. If he lacks suitable medicine, I will go in search of suitable medicine for him. If he lacks a proper attendant, I will attend on him. Let the venerable China not use the knife. Let the venerable China live. We want the venerable China to live. Friend Sariputta, it is not that I have no suitable food in medicine or no proper attendant, but rather, friend Sariputta, the teacher has long been worshipped by me with love, not without love, for it is proper for the disciple to worship the teacher with love, not without love. Friend Sariputta, remember this. The bhikkhu Chana will use the knife blamelessly. Note 1308. By making this statement, he is implicitly claiming arahantship, as will be made clear at paragraph 13. Whether his claim at this point was valid or not is uncertain. The commentary regarding it as a case of self overestimation. End note. We would ask the Venerable Chana certain questions. If the Venerable Chana finds it opportune to reply, ask friend Sariputta when I have heard I shall know. The, um, so we have to think that this sutta is, there's a reason for recording this, and there's a reason why you don't have any record of, of such things. Uh, commonplace where arahants were just killing themselves whenever there was any trouble. You, see, you hear about arahants who were sick and dying and, and didn't commit suicide. And uh, the other thing is is how apparent it, it appears quite uh, clear that the two arahants who came to visit him are adamant that this is not the the behavior of an arahant. So he's he throughout this he's going to he questions and he brings up other people who question the commentary's uh, explanation, which admittedly is is not obvious in from the text, but it just shows that the whole uh, he's following the 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 uh, thread of of the arahant speech that the two I mean Sariputta who is second to the Buddha. The commentary is following there uh, and explaining why they were uh, pretty adamant that this was not the right way to do things. So just keep that in mind when you, you read the, the notes, because he's, again, making some sort of fairly bold... Well, he's, he's, he's pointing out at least the questionable... Or he's, he's questioning the interpretation of the comment in these notes. But... It, it does make sense if what the commentary says is true, that he's not an arahant, uh, and he thinks he is. And well, we'll read through the sutta, we can discuss the rest later. Uh, I have a question. Um, in the previous paragraph, when Sariputta was addressing him, um, why did he speak like in, in, a, in a third person? Like, why, why not say, um, may you may you not use the knife it's uh but venerable Sariputta says like let let the venerable channa not use the knife like it's just a different translation it means the same it's the same in pali may be fine just uh yeah i was checking the pie and the pie only says that may may you friend actually channa not use the mm. knife right yeah okay well yeah. um I mean, it's just grammatical, but let's see. The only thing is it probably is third person. It's not me, you. Let me see. Probably. Oh, you're right. It is second. It is, yeah. It's strange that he uses third person when it's actually second person. Yeah. 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 is third person. Yeah, may, yeah. The, the second part is third person. That's why. Oh no, it is aharesi. I'm not sure about aharesi, but my question, my 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 feeling is it might actually be third person past as well. Aharesi, that's strange. Mm -hmm. My the, yes, yeah, yeah, no. is is third person. Anyway, the point is, it's just grammatical, and and that is that is the way they say things. They say don't don't may he not just by the way Pali work. I I I mean I interpreted that that uh, for like when Sariputta speaks about someone 
or about, let's say, his uh, his friend Channa, then, I mean, it's clear that he speaks uh, as there is, like, no self in there. Uh, I think it's more like, it's, a, it's just more of a polite way of speaking in Pali that mm-hmm. you, you just express your own wish. I wish that the Channa, like, you're saying it as though you're saying it to yourself as a means of not forcing yourself on the other person. I think it's more about that. I'm not sure that there's anything to read in here. I mean, it may be a feeling about arahants. My feeling is that it's just the way Pali, you're polite in Pali by not, or or the culture, let's not say the language, but the culture would be to just express wishes. Oh, I wish that this person, as though you were speaking to yourself so that you're not enforcing yourself. Because if you say ma, if you say don't, it's, it's like a command, right? And you don't want to command other people. It's not so polite. It could also be the way uh, it was reported in the first council, uh, probably by Venerable Anath. Yeah, I mean, we take it on confidence that this is how it was actually said. But we can't we can't guarantee that this is exactly how the words that were spoken. We just believe that they are. I mean, we have confidence in Ananda. This is it's good memory. Ananda, do you regard the eye? Eye consciousness and things come as well by the mind through eye consciousness. Thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Do you regard the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, the mind consciousness and things cognizable by the mind through mind consciousness? Thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. Friend Sariputta, I regard the eye eye consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through eye consciousness thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. I regard the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind, mind consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through mind consciousness thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And Chana, what have you seen and directly known in the eye and eye consciousness and in things cognizable by the mind through eye consciousness, that you regard them thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. What have you seen and directly known in the ear, in the nose, in the tongue, in the body, in the mind, in mind consciousness, and in things cognizable by the mind through mind consciousness, that you regard them thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Friend Sariputta, it is through seeing and directly knowing cessation in the eye, consciousness, and in things cognizable by the mind through eye consciousness, that I regard them thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. It is through seeing and directly knowing cessation in the ear, in the nose, in the tongue, in the body, in the mind, in mind consciousness, and in things cognizable by the mind through mind consciousness, that I regard them thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When this was said, the Venerable Ma Ch- Kunda said to the Venerable Channa, not 1309, MA say that the Venerable Ma Kunda gave him this instruction, thinking that he must still be an ordinary person, since he could not endure the deadly pain and wanted to commit suicide. End of notes. Therefore, Friend Channa, this instruction of the Blessed One is to be constantly given attention. There is wa- wavering in one who is dependent. There is no wavering in one who is independent. When there is no wavering, there is tranquility. When there is tranquility, there is no bias. When there is no bias, there is no coming and going. When there is no coming and going, there is no passing away and reappearing. Wherein there is no passing away and reappearing, there is no ear, nor behind, nor in between. There is the end of suffering. No 1310. <clears throat> the sense of this instruction might be explained with the help of M.A. Das. One is dependent because of craving and view of becoming dependent by abandoning them with the attaining of arantship, B.I.S. Nati bending come about through craving and the absence mean there is um, means there is no inclination or desire for existence there is no coming and going by the ending of rebirth and death 
no here, nor behind, nor in between, but the transcendence of this world, the world behind, and the passage between one and the other, there is the end of the suffering of defilements and the suffering of, of the round, end of notes. Then, when the Venerable Sariputta and the Venerable Mahakunda had advised the Venerable Chana thus, they rose from their seats and went away. Then, soon after they had gone, the Venerable Chana used the knife. Um, note 1311, M.A. He cut his throat, and just at that moment the fear of death descended on him, and the sign of future rebirth appeared. Recognizing that he was still an ordinary person, he was aroused and developed insight. Comprehending the formations, he attained Arahantship just before he expired. End of note. Then the Venerable Sariputta went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, the Venerable Channa has used the knife. What is his destination? What is his future course? Sariputta, didn't the Bhikkhu Channa declare to you, to you his blamelessness? Note 1312. M.A. Although this declaration of blamelessness was made while Channa was still a worldling, as his attain, attainment of final Nibbana followed immediately, the Buddha answered by referring to that very declaration. It should be noted that this commentarial interpretation is imposed on the text from the outside, as it were. If one sticks to the actual wording of the text, it seems that Channa was already an arahant when he made this declaration. The dramatic punch being delivered by the failure of his two brother monks to recognize this. The implication, of course, is that excru excruciating pain might motivate even an arahant to take his own life, not from aversion, but simply from a wish to be free from unbearable pain. End of so the, the actual wording of the text doesn't make it seem that Channa was already an arahant. There's the, it's still an interpretation. I mean, this is a hard sutta, and this is a hard question. There, there is a lot of debate around this, and there isn't... Um, a clear consensus. I mean, sorry, that's not fair to say, but there are there are many people who, like Bhikkhu Bodhi, question this. Uh, I mean, that being said, again, there's a reason why this sutta is remarkable, why why this instance was remarkable enough to add it as a sutta, and there's some clear uh, support given from the uh, how adamant the two people were that this isn't the behavior of an arahant. And and third, this. Again, this isn't the the wording is pretty clear. The Buddha doesn't say um, he he was he was an arahant when he slit his throat or whatever he did to kill himself. Instead, he asks the question, which is often a way to uh, to come at it a little bit more subtly and nuanced. Which I think the it, it the commentary's explanation makes sense in that light. But it's it's a little bit confusing because if uh, so. It, Let's say he wasn't an arahant yet, but then he must have been at least like a sultapana or sakadagami or so on, because he already like how he answers the questions. I mean, there. Well, are... I think the idea is he was a he was actually still just a world thing, but he had some some uh, he had under, he had been taught these things and had sort of intellectually. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you know, it's probably through some practice had seen it to some extent and intellectually extrapolated that that was true, and therefore there's no self and that sort of thing. And also, there are uh, uh, several ways a person can uh, or a meditator can uh, uh, overestimate themselves, thinking that they have attained nibbana when it could be something else. Yeah, it seems he was quite close to becoming an arahant if he was not already, as the commentary says. But so. It's impossible for an arahant to just want to exit or kill themselves. Well, that's the thing. That that's what's that. Sorry, that was the other thing I wanted to say. Is there's one note where he says it's possible that he didn't have any aversion, but he just wished to end the suffering. I mean, what's the difference? It, what's remarkable is that an arahant should have that wish at all. That, that an arahant should have any wish. Uh, well, anything that could be seen so so 
strongly as a wish. I mean, arahants have what you might call wishes in the sense of wishing to do A versus B in, in, in mundane terms, but it's not really a wish. And a wish to kill yourself, to to end pain is... I mean, I, I can't... Um, we're, we're, there, no one's in a position to, to make that determination of what an arahant could and couldn't do. And there's two things, I guess. One is... Um, one is that it's quite remarkable that they they should have again this this sort of a wish. But the other the other thing is um, the 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 wrongness of of these. There's sort of sometimes this belief that an arahant is freed in terms of what they can do, and an arahant can therefore do anything. Um, and you, you see this in cases where people wrongly uh, claim to be an arahant. And then excuse or or um, explain away behavior that is clearly out of line with an arahant. And in fact, I would say an arahant is is restricted incredibly by what they can do, much more than is free to do whatever they want and is held blameless. I mean, you hear these these stories or people telling stories of how the Buddha drove a Mercedes or so. Not the Buddha drove it, but they they tell stories about a Buddha driving a Mercedes and wearing jewelry and so on, giving the point that he's a Buddha. He has no attachment to any of these things. But there's no way in any universe that a Buddha would do any of those things. The Buddha is incredibly restricted as well. And so to think that an arahant would kill themselves, um, it's hard to believe. Yeah, it's even hard to believe to like uh, for a Sotapanna to want to kill themselves or... I'm wanting the pain to end is uh, probably vibhatana, person vibhatana. Yeah, I mean, it's reasonable. It's just um, it's the real deep and and um, the profound shift in perspective. You're no longer taking the pain as self. It's not something that's afflicting you. It's an experience. That's the. I mean, it's it's not something simple. It's not something trivial. It's a profound shift that comes through. That's why enlightenment is a very profound and significant thing because it does have that incredible ability to allow you to deal with something that is near impossible to deal with because it's no longer you dealing with it. I think I there, mean, there is uh, one case in the video, if I remember right, that like if you are uh, terminally ill and there is no hope of recovery and you are being a huge burden to everybody around you, you can reject food or arms food and not to continue the life, but not commit suicide. Well, you can always reject arms food. There's a question of whether an arahant would or not. It's, it's Yeah, it's reasonable that a person who is not an arahant might. That is out of compassion to people who's, who are taking care of the person because you're yeah. just being a burden and there's no way for you to recover or be a uh, be useful to anybody. Well, allowing people to care for you is being useful for sure. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, there, there's a difference between what's allowable in the Vinaya and what an arahant would do. I guess is it allowable to stop eating? I don't. I don't. Can't think of any instance where you have to accept food. You're never required to accept food from anyone, as far as I know. I can't think of any rule regarding a. a I mean, a requirement of accepting anything from anyone. I, I can't think of any instance so if someone decides they want to stop eating to because they feel like they're a burden i don't think there's anything to stop them fasting is not um in accordance with the buddhist teaching it's not something it's not clear cut exactly so someone can not eat for a day and i i knew a monk once who anytime he had a lustful thought he would he would not eat that day then he ended up having stomach uh, his stomach uh, broke he had to go see a doctor and had to start taking medication or something because uh, because he stopped eating that's what he told me i, I think the difference is one thing uh, not eating uh, indefinitely to uh, not to continue living mm -hmm. yeah i don't think there's fast. any there's no there's no you're not actively killing yourself but i wouldn't yeah, say that that's the behavior in our hunt because you're still refusing food out of a desire to, to to not live, out of a out of a, a wish, maybe because it's a burden to whoever is around you. I, I don't see that as an issue, but 
Certainly, many people might. Venerable sir, there is a Wajian village called Pubajira. There, the Venerable Channa had friendly families, intimate families, approachable families, as his supporters. Note 1313. The terms used to describe the lay families which supported the Venerable Channa, Mitta Kulani, Suhaja Kulani, Upa Vaj. Vajakulani are obviously synonymous. The third term gives the opportunity for a word play. Emma glosses it Upasankamita Bakulani. Families to be approached, that is, for his requisites. According to CPD, Upavaja here represents Sanskrit Upavarya. The word in this sense is not in P-E-D, though this may be the only instance where it bears such a meaning. The word is hom- homonymous with another word meaning blameworthy, representing Sanskrit upawa, upawadya, thus linking up with Channa's earlier avowal that he would kill himself blamelessly, Anupa Waja. Uh, see the following note. Indeed, Sariputta, the Bhikkhu Channa, had friendly families, intimate families, approachable families, as his supporters. But I do not say that to this extent he was blameworthy. Sariputta, when one lays down this body and takes up a new body, then I say one is blameworthy. This did not happen in this case of the Bhikkhu Channa. The Bhikkhu Channa used the knife blamelessly. Note 13, 14. This statement seems to imply that Channa was an arhant at the time he committed suicide, though the commentary explains otherwise. When the Buddha speaks about the conditions under which one is blameworthy, Sa Upawaja. Upavaja represents Upavadya. The earlier MA explained the correct sense of Upavajakulani. Here the commentator seems obvious to the pun and comments as if Channa had actually been at fault for associating too closely with lay people. The elder Sariputta showing the fault of intimacy with families Kula Sangsagadosa, in the pre- preliminary stage of practice, asks when that bhikkhu had such supporters, could he have attained final nibbana? The Blessed One answers, showing that he was not intimate with families. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Sariputta was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So it's a little bit confusing to me. So the Venerable Sariputta said, I mean, answered the question with whether Channa was blameless uh, to that actually he was associating, I mean, had like close families and friends and that would imply that uh, in Sariputta's eyes he might not have been an arahant. I think here the Buddha is the criteria used by the Buddha is whether somebody is reborn again. Or whether of course. Is reborn. Not, he, he doesn't imply that he was an arahant at the time he attempted to commit suicide. So if somebody commits suicide and he is not uh, born again that is a blameless uh, death, is what is Yeah, implied. I mean, the, not... the, the Buddha's explanation is in line with, I mean, explains why the commentary explains it the way it does. Bhikkhu Bodhi does a little bit of a disservice. Well, he, he goes a little bit too far in, in my mind, in, in ter- like claiming that this text says what it doesn't say. In fact, the Buddha, the Buddha explaining how he can call it blameless is quite clear. He says it's blameless because of the results. I mean, that's that's um, one way. I mean, that, that's how how he's calling it blameless, and he makes that quite clear. He's not calling it blameless actually because of 
his uh, the, the motivations for killing himself. He's calling it blameless because, well, he he was the process involved led him to arahantship. In fact, killing himself was a catalyst for enlightenment, which makes it so remarkable. Is that uh, he he was clearly you know working his way through the practice and had developed some ability to see clearly, and as a result, when he did use the knife, he he got a wake up call. I heard a story about a monk who, a Burmese no, a, a, I think a foreign monk who ordained in Burma, Burma, who did this, who who thought they were enlightened and decided to kill themselves and did the same thing happened as as after they cut themselves cut their wrists or something they had visions of hell and visions horrific visions that scared them and they didn't die and they realized that they weren't in life yeah i was i was thinking maybe this uh this event inspired all the other monks to try this i mean i think I mean, not think. I I know for sure I heard this story from a monk. I won't name him. Um, But he said that uh, these, I mean, he was an arahant or at least like it it was like almost our arahants would commit suicide or like it's blameless. Yeah, I don't, I mean, clearly the commentary disagrees. Or it seems the commentary disagrees. It certainly, I think, is against the orthodox tradition. Again, it it would be remarkable to think that an arahant would. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how you explained right now, and also like just thinking how a uh, sotapanna, or like you don't really think like that. You you're not anymore mm-hmm. inclined towards. Oh, I want to be free from this or that. Or, or even the, the idea of not being a burden does it does exist, but it doesn't extend to actual taking action like that. There's the example where the sort of a trivial example where it's trivial, um, like where you're about to die and you choose the manner of death in a very specific case. Um, Ananda is said to have committed self immolation. Um, I mean, it's a story. I'm not sure how reliable the story is or where exactly it is, but the story goes that he floated above the river and burst spontaneously in in flames, causing his bones to fall on both sides of the river so that his two two families could get half of the relic siege. I think it was on. It was, yes. So it appears that he, in a way, committed suicide, except that that was the moment of his death, and he just, I guess you might say after he died, he made a determination that, that upon his death, his body should explode. So it wasn't actually killing himself. It was just um, dealing with the bodily part. Yeah, the, uh, our hands with the magical powers actually can make that happen even after they uh, die. Another example would be Venerable Mahakasapa. I think... Uh, uh, Ajatasat, King Ajatasat wanted to pay respect, but he couldn't come in time. Uh, when Mahakasapa made a determination when the king comes, uh, put two uh, rocks closing in the chamber, you know, chamber. It opened up for the king to pay respect, something like that. Mm. Well, the Buddha's body is another sort of example, an example of how uh, it wouldn't light until Kasupa got there. That was the day was working. Maybe that had something to do with Ananda and Kasapa as well, that in fact the devas were involved. I'm still stuck on the note from uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi where he wrote that he didn't take his life from aversion, but simply from a wish to be free from unbearable pain. And that doesn't well, that make sense. That was my point. Is yes. It doesn't uh, really make sense. Because, uh, for example, the Buddha he, uh, also had uh, a lot of pain during his um, lifetime and teaching. But his response, for example, was to give his body rest so his body he he won't destroy the body but there is no uh, reaction like there, there is no unbearable uh, unbearable pain you can't imagine for an arahan that he if there's no aversion what what else is there yeah well it's hard to you can't really compare with the buddha first of all the buddha wasn't um 
this wasn't in this state. There are states that are quite horrific that um, a normal person would not be expected to be able to bear. But uh, yeah, the point remains. How do you explain a wish, an arahant having a wish, a wish in, in any sense, except the mundane, where we say, we use the word, but it really just means uh, a determining of what's proper. So you could say, did the, did the could an arahant determine that it's proper to take to to use a knife or whatever to cut their throat? Really hard to hard to see. What an arahant would do is uh, like uh, contemplate in the dhamma that would, when the pain becomes debilitating, like for example, contemplating the bodhjangas would uh, make it subside. Right. You have yeah. cases where the other arahants were quite ill. Even the Buddha himself, when he had a back pain, he would rest for a while, allowing the thing, uh, asking Venerable Sariputta to continue. There's like Giri Mananda uh, and Kasapa and Ananda. The Giri Mananda Sutta is a very good one. He was he was an Arahant, wasn't he? There's a similar story about uh, Venerable Gothika. He also attempted to commit suicide because he couldn't. Uh, sustain his meditative attainments and Mara tried to uh, get the Buddha to stop him but the Buddha I think ignored Mara. Similarly he also focused on the pain and attained around at the final moment. So he's saying again what did Mara tell him to do, the Buddha to do? Uh, so according to the uh, story uh, the Mara uh, asked, uh, told the Buddha that he, this monk is about to commit suicide. Mm. I think uh, the Buddha did not uh, listen to Mara and let it happen. Uh, so, the final moment, uh, the Venerable Gothika uh, focused on the pain and he was able to attain Arahant. Mm. He committed suicide because he could, because due to the illness, he couldn't uh, sustain the jhanas. Like he would. Uh, Lose his jhanas after a short while, something like that. I have heard one story where where, where a saint was uh, trying to commit suicide by drowning himself in the river, and his uh, disciple came there and uh, he asked that why you were doing this. And uh, prior to this event, the uh, the the saint was having uh, abdominal pain for for days, and he waited if the pain is uh, going away or not. Uh, when it didn't go away, then he uh, decided that he would drown himself in the river. And uh, when his disciple came to ask him why you are doing it, he answered that uh, there is no use of this body anymore. That's why I'm doing it. Mara saw six times it happened and he decided to commit suicide by cutting his throat. Mara saw this and reported it to the Buddha, but the Buddha arrived. So the Buddha went and Gotika lays on the couch. After cutting his throat, he... I don't understand the, this explanation. So checked his final agony. I don't understand what that means. I mean, he faced his pain, I guess is the point. The, the, the real point there, I think that's interesting, is that death is a real catalyst for enlightenment. So it is, it is understandable that in certain cases, as you're dying uh, after having committed suicide, that someone becomes enlightened, simply because of how shocking and how... how abrupt death is, how, how it forces you to let go. But the point is, it, it requires, I mean, these cases are remarkable because of how unlikely it is. It's like it's like gambling, in fact. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that you would want to knowingly gamble on. And it happens because they, they well, the first case it happened because he thought he was enlightened already. The second case it happened because he was just desperate and desperate for, for a way out or, or was uh, fed up. But they both must have had some very great practices to allow them to be shocked as they were dying. But suicide isn't committing. If you attempt to commit suicide, it's an offense. It's a minor offense. Um, if you help someone to commit suicide, a monk who helps someone to commit suicide is no longer a monk. It's considered murder or it's, it's considered strong enough to be in that same group of offenses that murder is in, such that if you commit it, you're no longer a monk. I mean, it's explicitly stated, helping someone to commit suicide is 
you're thrown out. You you can no longer ever be a monk again. Does it count for giving advice as well, Bhante? Like yes. a monk uh, says euthanasia is okay. He's, he's no longer a monk. Um, but if you say it generally, it's probably not enough to convict. But uh, if you say ambo purisa kim tu imina papa kina du jivite na matanti jivita sayoti. Matante jivita sayoti. Death is better for you. That's enough. If they then kill themselves. In other words, if you encourage someone to kill themselves. But, um, no, I mean, suicide. I, I I once asked Ajahn Tong, or I would, no, I was present when someone asked Ajahn Tong, and he said, the, the question was, what happens when someone commits suicide? And his immediate response was, they go to hell. I mean, he, he pointed out, especially as a human being, um, not recognizing the value of the human life. That's a real corruption of mind to not see that, to not value humanity. Hard to, gonna be hard to ever be born a human again. I'm I'm just thinking um of these people who are have like constant they are not enlightened and they are in pain and let's say if they in huge pain and they I mean they can't practice if they are frustrated by it maybe uh, averse right like what's this what's the solution like what's it's i know it's still through it it's just well it isn't it, there isn't a solution it's the it's the consequence i mean it's generally the consequences of karma it's, it's the solution is to not put yourself in that position to to be to be trained in mindfulness i mean there is no solution for most beings in the world there's horrible suffering that can be solved it's just continuous there's beings in hell and there's no solution to a being in hell right the the situation in the middle east there's children being bombed there's horrific suffering there was this music festival where people were just slaughtered indiscriminately and there's there's no solution i mean the solutions are simple and they require training they require changing the path changing your path angulimala for example who was uh beaten quite severely after being such a horrible person and such cruel and malevolent deeds. He had a solution because he had been practicing. Um, I mean, re recently I, I read the, a lawyer um, who's fighting for it, euthanasia in, in Hungary because he has ALS. So I don't think they are in pain, right? But they uh, still completely will um, lose their ability to even talk and anything. But, I mean, I can imagine enduring that for some reason. But if if someone is in severe pain constantly, I mean, it's just... I, I still... I can sympathize here with Channa, like, wow... I, I can understand how he thinks this is a, this is a way out of it. This is... Certainly, why a lot of people would kill themselves. It's reason to understand why people do it. How does suicide not break the first pe precept? Well, that's what I was going to say. Is I don't think it does break the first precept because you're doing it to yourself. You're not killing anyone else. I mean, it's semantic at that point, but it's still considered to be a, a really bad idea. It's, you know, some, as Ajahn Tong said, it leads you to hell. The kind of thing only humans do. I'm trying to think if there's any animals that commit suicide. I, I wouldn't be the expert on that, but... I think sometimes point. animals, they go in front of cars to commit suicide, especially if they're no. badly hurt or circumstances. That's what I've heard. I, never, I guess it, that makes like sense. Spiders. I, find, I find it hard to believe that animals have that presence of mind to think of themselves as being... Like, to be able to process... Anyway, that's just not really interesting. Um but I was just thinking that it, it, it's kind of mostly a human, my thought was it was mostly a human phenomenon. And that's the big problem with killing yourself is that you're ending your human life. A weird question about this. Is it possible that this type of thing, like suicide or wanting to come, it runs in the family? Like, is there such a thing like family karma or things like that? Well, people are born often with people with similar karma or shared karma that they've, they've lived together in the past so they can have, have very similar 
I mean, you 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 change based on the people you're around, right? We pick up our the people around us. We pick up their behaviors and attitudes. I mean, some people just commit suicide, especially young people commit suicide just for uh, broken affairs, or affairs gone wrong, even for the smallest thing. Yeah, it's just another one of the things people do is kill themselves. I read an article recently that uh, veterinarians are killing themselves in high numbers. And one of the things it listed about was the frequent euthanasia. They do a lot of killing of, of old, sick and old animals, and that takes a toll on their mental health. I mean, isn't it fair to say that everyone thinks about it at some point? It's not, it's not that uncommon. Well, thinking about things is pretty common. I mean, anything we hear about, we think about, right? But I never thought that, about killing someone. I don't think so. It's not. It's. <laughs> well, I think it's probably pretty common for people to quote unquote think of killing someone. Uh -huh. It's it's okay. a it's a dangerous phrase because we usually mean it as contemplating it, considering it. There's a difference between thinking something like I always think back to this monk who did try to kill himself several times, but uh, he was having thoughts that he didn't want. So thoughts that he wouldn't tell me what they were, but he said they were just horrific thoughts. And I kept trying to tell him, you know, thoughts are just thoughts. And so suppose someone think. I mean, it's, it seems to me quite common for someone, you hear about people who kill themselves and you question, you say, would I ever do such a thing? And immediately, if most people I would think, no, I have no, I mean, obviously not, I have no reason to do that. Or when things are bad, they might think, oh yeah, people kill themselves over this. So that's interesting that people do that, but you wouldn't ever contemplate it. People, it, it's, it's not uncommon for people to contemplate suicide, but I wouldn't say most people contemplate suicide. Mm -hmm. That's my okay. guess. It's not uncommon, I would say, right? We have a certain percentage of the population does end up trying to commit suicide, a small percentage, and probably a larger percentage contemplates it at some point in their lives. Does everyone or most people? I, I, I guess not. But but the point I wanted to make is that's different from actually having the thought or questioning because that's just instinctual or, or it's involuntary. When you think of something, you the question quite quickly arises, would I ever do such a thing? Curiosity more than anything. I mean, I think in desperate situation, situations, a lot of people would think about something like that. And But when it comes to doing it, then the number would be a lot less. Like, I think that's... Yeah, I would say even thing. the number of people actually considering it, or we'd say seriously considering it, is much smaller. I would say most people in desperate... The majority of people in desperate situations are still... I mean, it's just a guess. Are still probably disinclined. It's not to trivialize it, but there's a significant portion of people who certainly would consider it. Bante, is death by drugs or intoxicants considered suicide? Or death by suicidal lust as in the case of eating disorders? Suicidal lust, that's not a term I've ever heard before. <laughs> I, don't, I don't quite get that. But um, suicide would require you to intend your own death. Death isn't always intentional, so that's the question you have to ask. Are these intentional deaths or not intentional deaths? It's kind of academic at that point. I mean, it, it, it's not really all that significant whether you uh, intended to kill yourself. I mean, that's what constitutes breaking the first precept, let's say. But a more important question is what's going on in your mind and how, and what sort of unwholesomeness is going on in your mind. You can decide not to kill yourself and still have be consumed by unwholesomeness in your mind if you're just wailing and screaming over the pain. Even those who uh, attempt suicide, uh, I bet most of them uh, become afraid at the last moment. Because mm -hmm. all unlit, unenlightened beings are afraid of death. So even if you attempt to commit suicide, you, at the last moment you feel fear of the unknowing, what is going to happen next. Yeah, and what is significant is the decision. When you make a decision to kill yourself, that's pretty a pretty significant thing. That's I mean, it's why the first precept is so important, so so explicitly stated. Because uh, again, I mean, it is it is true that there are 
moments of unwholesomeness, no matter what you decide or don't decide. But when you make a decision to do something, it, it has quite a distinct effect. When you decide to kill someone, when you decide to kill yourself, it's quite remarkable that anyone who makes that decision to, to kill themselves could then become enlightened. That's something to consider here. The point the commentary makes is that it was so shocking, the realization, oh, wait, I'm not enlightened. But, it, I mean, it's not far-fetched. Again, the, I heard the story of a monk, something very similar happened. He realized what a, what a mistake it had been to try and kill himself, and he was just petrified at, at the consequences. It can be a real wake-up call. I mean, I think we already talked about it, but uh, if you want to refresh uh, this for this question, like, what uh, what should we do if someone we know, a friend or someone... Uh, is very inclined to to do that. I uh, I think the correct answer is you should contact a suicide. You should have them connect them with suicide helplines. We we don't have such a thing here. Well, professionals. Uh, I mean, maybe there's not the same policies there, but legally, that's what you have to do. I think here in the West. Uh, but but I think there's a good point to that in the sense that it's not really your sphere i mean it's not really it's going too far to get caught up in such things someone wants to kill themselves it's just something you're better to stay at arm's length I mean, to some extent there's a there's a limit to what you can do mm -hmm. um, obviously you can open the door and provide resources regarding meditation but my, my point is just that for many people they're they're not they're not there they are too far gone and issues of suicide are a little bit outside of what you can help with yeah thank you maybe that's not quite fair i mean you might you probably have some meditators we have monks so you're going to have to deal with such people I, I i speak cautiously because again that's sort of legally what we're required to do here and you can get in real trouble if you try to um counsel people who are who are trying who are interested in committing suicide i think anyway i think there's issues there we certainly were trained I, I took a course at university about it and we were trained to immediately have to find someone who is certified and qualified to talk to people uh, were you taking a psychology lesson or something or no it was just a, a, a social studies an extracurricular oh that, that sounds pretty neat uh useful useful to learn how to yeah I mean, I think, yeah go ahead about that i think some of the i think the the teachings and the advice that we would give to meditators is is often i mean it's is sufficient and could be used for people who have suicidal tendencies but but no, I mean, on the other hand, if they have real psychological issues and, and they keep going back to the idea of killing themselves, it can often be the kind of thing that really you need someone who is, I don't want to say trained to do it, but is in the profession of doing it. And it kind of is something you just let therapists deal with. It kind of points to the the difference between a therapist and, say, a meditation teacher, that if someone is having real issues, then they need more they need someone who's getting paid to, i don't want to say paid to do it but is is really invested in it and it's not really appropriate i mean there's there's room to say i think that on to some in some instances it's not appropriate for a meditation teacher to get involved i mean i say that because i've seen monks who were suicidal and they really needed someone who had more time and interest and was more invested in in them and in you know, sitting and listening to them talk about their problems, I guess, and uh, do a lot more than, than should be expected of someone who's following the Buddha path. It, it's kind of more of a Buddhist thing to, to let people go, and you're not responsible for keeping them alive, which is why I think it is reasonable to some, in some, depending on the circumstances, to refer them to someone who is trained, who is in, uh, whose job is to do that. I think that's compassionate to, to say, you know, look, I'll connect you with someone who is now if you live in a society where there are no people who deal with people committing suicide then I don't know that that's that common I would imagine in Romania there are people who are 
I meant those, uh, you mentioned something like a line, like uh, someone to call anonym, anonymously or something. But psychologists are yeah. dealing with this, I think. So, yeah, I would connect them with that sort of professional. Mm -hmm. I, think yeah, I think it depends on the situation. I was going to say yeah. some of those people are just looking for attention and uh, they really uh, have like an inferiority complex and therapists or, or psychologists are good at uh, giving them something to like so they have a meaning or something. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the, the, the and this is hard to judge, but the level of spirituality, spiritual growth of the person, like how, how sent, how, how, deep and how how evolved the person is i mean it's not the right word exactly but their depth of let's say the wisdom of the person contemplating suicide if they ha if they have the ability to understand the dhamma which is again hard for anyone who's not a buddha to assess but if they have that then you could reach them and certainly help them and provide use meditation as a means of helping them see through it but it's the kind of thing where i would try but be but acknowledge that at some point they might just be unreachable and they're just not listening to you and not following the instructions and then you might send them to a professional again it's or it's with reluctance that i mean the, the, there's problems with that as well because we don't have that much confidence in in secular psychology but it is the the idea is that it's the accepted thing to do and you acknowledge at some point that i can't help you this is what people do in the world. These are people who might uh, provide what you're looking for, for people who aren't looking for, who aren't actually you know, trying to meditate, for example. And Mara play a role in that with, with suicidal thoughts? Or Mara is more about temptations, like well, with the senses? Again, Mara is of different kinds, right? There's, so it definitely involves unwholesomeness, which is a kind of Mara. But as far as it involving devas, um, I don't know, probably not. I think in certain cases, right, Mara comes to people and tries to convince them to kill themselves. Like the Buddha, he came to the Buddha. To, ki to kill her himself? The Buddha to kill himself? Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Out wow. <laughs> That's would you, would interesting. Would you kindly die also? <laughs> Just go die. Sanka, can you repeat? <laughs> I didn't hear what Sanka said. Can you repeat, Sanka? No, I was saying, I'm not saying the exact words, but Mara, immediately after the Buddha attained enlightenment, Mara came and <laughs> invited him to pass into Paribana. I I heard about uh, Mara saying, now you just do good, don't teach. But I didn't, I, I missed this part, maybe. No, that was... Um... Before? That was before he was enlightened. After he became enlightened, the Buddha suggested that, it was, sorry, Mara suggested, it was a sound suggestion, suggested that he live in comfort, that there's no reason to teach. The problem yeah. is the Buddha already agreed to teach. Before, and then when the Buddha was 80, Mara said again, you know, well, you've done what you set out to do, it's time to enter into Parinibbana, and the Buddha agreed in the sense of agreed that it was time, not agreed to be to be pushed into it or to be convinced into it, that the Buddha agreed that it was time, acknowledged that it was time. But uh, is euthanasia compassionate for those who are in chronic excruciating physical pain? Is there such a thing as skillful killing? There's no such thing as skillful. Skillful. From a meditator's point of view, um, uh, it uh, it kind of seems like um, it might be uh, called uh, that it 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 is kind of like getting carried away. For example, uh, so many people committed suicide in uh, 2008 after 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 the collapse of economy in uh, U.S. from uh, high raising high rise buildings, and uh, uh, the only problem they had was the stress of uh, feeding maybe their family or 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 the loans or or things like that so there was like the only thing that uh, they were trying to do i think was just to escape the pain so uh, in that moment if if they could uh, be mindful and uh, they if they could say that 
uh, mindful either stress, stress or like pain, pain or like uh, if someone is in physical pain, if uh, if I think if from the medit meditator's point of view, if they can acknowledge that is is not in me but uh, is is in some is is in the outer world or maybe in the body or it's just it, it's not in me or then i think there is the there is no problem of uh, of, of of this kind of things or this kind of uh, thoughts to arise at the first place because i, I think is maybe the main cause of this is uh, less mindfulness and maybe that's my point uh, th there's a reason why sickness and death are both good catalysts for enlightenment. Uh, I mean, people who are suffering horribly, um, repeatedly, chronically, are likely to, through through experiencing it and through having to face it, appreciate uh, most obviously non-self and become dispassionate. You let go. Because there's no choice, there's no solution, and that's the thing: is if you're constantly seeking out solutions, you're never going to let go. You're always trying to fix. You're always trying to escape, and until you're forced to face what is unbearable, even you're never going to let go. To just uh, address a little bit more this question uh, from Michael about uh, is it compassionate to help someone commit suicide i think i think it's a actually a version right like they don't they can't bear the suffering of, of seeing them suffer right that's quite common i don't i don't think that's it's maybe not fair to say it's always a version but that is a big reason why it's unacceptable and why it can be horrific to have to watch other people die is because you yourself are reacting to it or even like what I'm seeing and experiencing most most often is that people when people see <clears throat> a horrific disease on on someone else, um, they are like, "Oh man, I couldn't live with this." Or I mean, I feel like they even give you the idea to, you know, you should end your life or you should seek help <laughs> to end your life because um, I don't know without. Um, moving your limbs or being paraplegic or having ALS or something is so horrific that you shouldn't exist, basically. There, there is this attitude, for sure. Unfortunately, people to encourage others to commit suicide or help them. Yeah. Because of the aversion, the disliking of it. And, and it's actually sad when uh, when someone sees another person in, in a wheelchair or something and they, I mean, you can see the aversion in, uh, on them, on their face or something. Like, that's, that's not compassion. Well, I, I wanted to inter... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. go ahead. Thank you. Well, I wanted to interject here that it's really important that if you've never seen anybody die and if you don't participate in people's death process or other people or other beings' death process, it's really important not to think that you know what they're thinking which I see a lot here. You think it's a version. You think it could be part of it, could be a version. And I remember when Bhante was saying that if you see someone um, being racist towards someone, you should say, it's racism. You shouldn't just stand by and not help. For a person who's involved in someone else's death and is there the whole time, from my point of view, I think the feeling is, I'm not being helpful. It's not so much a version, it's seeing the suffering. It's that... There's nobody else arriving to help, and you haven't helped. And also, there's different um, degrees of killing or of assaulting someone or of rape or of wrong speech. And I think it's wrong to try to put it all in the same pot to say what well, the killing is killing. Well, there's the killing that happened in Israel with that um, music festival, and then there's the killing when you're trying to help someone at the very last second, die with a peaceful mind. Um, with with assault, it's the same thing. I mean, you could beat someone into unconsciousness, or it's considered assault if I touch someone, I put a blood pressure cuff on someone without written informed consent. They're not the same thing. So it's just mm -hmm. what I have to say. No, that's the point, is that 
there's two distinct things here. There's the unwholesomeness, which happens moment by moment, and it that's going to differ significantly. I mean, gross. There's going to be a, a gross and drastic difference between various deeds. But again, there's also the deliberate, intentional acting in order for to end someone's life, and that is quite significant. If you've never killed yourself, again, yeah, you 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 can't. You can't know the significance of it, but it's remarkable how significant it is to kill. I think people who do this for a living, who help others when they die, their thought process is, I'm helping this person go with a more peaceful mind. It's not that I'm ending their life. They're dying anyway, no matter what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, but that's just, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's your view. Uh, right. You'd have to experience it to know how it actually feels. I mean, I was quite shocked the first time I took a significant life when I was a teenager, and it it was profound to me how how how, um, how consequential the killing was. It never gets easy, but when you did it, I think you were talking about using a gun. I mean, this being was going to live a a while longer, maybe, right? For sure. It it yeah it. But it's that there's the two distinct aspects that makes it quite unwholesome, but doesn't change the fact that it's an actual killing. I mean, again, we talked about this, but the idea that you're helping someone by killing them is just wrong view. I mean, it's not actually it's accorded in accordance with reality. It doesn't actually help. It doesn't no, make I understand. Their death any more, more wholesome or peaceful or good, useful. I, I agree with you and I respect it. It's just that sometimes... You can just say, I'm a monk. I don't have to make decisions like that. I'm going to be careful to not put myself in those situations. But other people don't have that sort of luxury. I don't have the luxury of not doing what I'm supposed to do at work. I have to make a decision. My only decision well, is I'm just, well, I'm, I'm not showing up for work today. Yeah, there's there's no luxury. About, yeah, I mean, sure, for people who break the precepts, that's certainly none of anyone else's business, but... It doesn't. Uh, I mean, it's not really an excuse because you can you can decide to die before you break the precepts. You do have that luxury. You can decide to, uh, to do anything. You can you can always decide not to break the five precepts if you're if you're a person who intends to keep them. Again, that that's personal. It's not something anyone should judge. I know that's been an issue. We shouldn't judge other people or try and condemn them or anything, but. If someone asks our advice, I mean, you do have the luxury. That's the luxury of samsara. Is you can do whatever you want, and you can no. always decide not to not to do something. I, I do see your point. Thank you, Bond. I also wanted to just say a little bit uh, to react to that. Our, I definitely haven't seen anyone die. So I mean, you're you're. I, I cannot understand your perspective probably, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's what I, th that's what I was trying to say, that it's helpful to me to be part of this group. But sometimes when people start talking, you know, years ago we were talking about um, abortion, and there are men who were chiming in on, well, this is killing, it shouldn't. Well, yeah, I understand this is your opinion, and I respect it. But quite honestly, you as a man will never be in that position. You never were in that position. You never will be in that position. So when people give opinions about things that they, they're never going to be in that position and they're being really definitive, like, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to ask Vante about this. Like, it's okay to give a pain, pain relief and such things, right? Like when, when someone is dying and like you want to help, I mean that that's like the least you can do or something. Yeah, I mean it's it's easy for anyone to with a logical brain to read the precepts and make it out to be very black and white. Um and it happens because they have perfect confidence that they're right. But I think I think what I would say is it's not so much that they can't say those things because they haven't been in the situation, but it doesn't it doesn't say anything about how wise that person is i mean them speaking up like that is kind of um at least insensitive but also a little bit unwise perhaps so i i mean what i don't want to do is say they're 
they they can't be sure of that because they haven't been in that position. And obviously I'm in that position regarding abortion, but um, they, there has to be the acknowledgement that you're not qualified to describe, to advise someone or to help someone understand the ramifications of say abortion, because you don't have the capacity to appreciate what that person is going through. You understand that the sort of the distinction, like it, it is true what they're saying, but like, uh, they're only just parroting some very simple logic, like the rules are clear. It is killing. You have broken the precept if you commit abortion, but that doesn't make you the right person to to talk about it. Yeah, like uh, uh, saying that uh, because you have, uh, to give an analogy, uh, because you haven't been a uh, uh, drug addict or somebody addicted to alcohol, you can't uh, say that alcohol is bad or something like that. Bad for you. I mean, you can't. But, you are not the, qualified the to advise that, the person. Yeah. The point is that. Yeah, you, I agree. I you, agree with you, Bhante. Yeah. You're not likely to come across as helpful. You're not li- likely to say the things that are helpful because you just don't understand the situation. You're. You have to appreciate your your own inability to understand the situation, even though you have logic on your side. So that's what I'm saying is we have to be careful about being Buddhist. Um, what's the, no, that's not the right term, but like uh, lawyers kind of thing where we just argue logic and reason where we are. Like what I mean to say is we, we argue from very cut and dried principles. Okay. Yeah. On so. the, on the other hand, it is probably also wrong to say that because you haven't at that first hand experience you have you there's no way for you to know whether something is right or wrong that is also wrong i think because yeah it would be wrong to can... say that, that can i say something like it's not a it's not a de- sorry just one last thing it's not a defense to say uh to dismiss the fact that something is unwholesome or uh transgressing and uh, crossing a line so it's not a defense but there is a point there. go ahead um, I just want to apologize with Aurora, maybe my comments uh, trigger her, but I just want to say that um, I have made this comment uh, related to two things, like uh, the first thing is that uh, compassion is, uh, I mean, it is very difficult to perform compassion if you think about the compassion maybe that the Buddha can have, is not similar to the compassion that we perform. So on this you know, on this topic, I was saying that sentence. And also, if you think about uh, the mind moment to moment, uh, you know, you say that in euthanasia, you you help somebody to die because you are, because of compassion and love. And this is difficult because it's not that uh, in the moment of the action that you do, you perform mm-hmm. compassion every moment. You might have uh, compassion, but also other mixed um a feeling or or different mind that arising and seizing so for that reason only i was saying that um i have uh, experience uh, i have bring somebody to the end of his life and uh, as a carer i can say that uh, at the end uh, the last days it is it was really stressful for everyone even for family member because you know there is this uh, unknown of death and uh, people that uh, is not training the mind for them is very difficult to understand and to accept and uh, uh, i mean the person is uh, in my experience he died uh, naturally and uh, what we could do at that moment was only you know help him we have given painkillers morphine and uh, we was holding his hands but uh, i don't know um i i cannot say to you that uh you know if i was helping him to perform it in asia it was out of compassion I, i'm i'm not sure about that so only for this reason i just write the comments on the chat sorry i like you <laughs> i'm not upset with you i just want to tell you that a lot of the hospice uh, nurses and a lot of nurses and hospitals who are involved in this process on some level majority of them don't treat life as um, something simple, superficial at all. Actually, majority of them cannot be involved in it. 
a right. lot of nurses, like in, in my department, a lot of um, nurse anesthetists, a lot of anesthesiologists, they cannot be involved in abortion. They just simply refuse. We have mm-hmm. the right to refuse. We, we have a right to stop where it crosses some sort of a moral issue. The majority of people cannot do it. We, we really value life. We will really go the extra mile to help someone live and recover. I, I haven't met anybody who just takes it lightly. In all my years of experience, I've never met such a person. Yeah, to add to the previous comment, uh, compassion is uh, wishing for people to, uh, wishing or preferring people free themselves from suffering or preferring suffering to go away. But next moment you uh, decide, okay, how, what can I do to make the suffering go away? You might decide out of ignorance. So the next moment can be ignorant moments. Compassion is one thing and doing something. That yeah. Is, uh, I'm, absolutely it's an important point whenever we talk about compassion that it's not synonymous with wisdom i I hesitate to say that there's a i had a a, a many many years ago i had an argument with a mahayana buddhist who in fact did believe that compassion and wisdom are synonymous and it was hard for me to understand that but they indeed are not synonymous and compassion is not on the level of wisdom compassion is a occasional mind state, right? For those of you who are studying Abhidhamma. Yes. It, uh, it, sometimes you feel compassion, and that's a good thing, but it is not um, it's not a safe, safe, uh, sort of security. It's not in uh, defense, because it's not on the level of wisdom, which allows for compassion, and, and which, or not allows for it, but which um, provides uh, it, cultivates compassion, grows compassion. A person who is wise will be obviously more often compassionate, but it doesn't go the other way around where I'm compassionate, therefore it was wise. It doesn't, go the, it doesn't work in the opposite direction. Compassion doesn't necessarily lead to wisdom or include wisdom. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful but not wisdom. Yeah. Also, if we, uh, if, I mean, if the, um, I don't know if it is how much correct it is, but I think uh, in the ultimate reality, uh, there is like no pain and no um, uh, no attachment or not. And there is not anything like maybe like I don't know how much accurate I am, but I think uh, our goal is to like be aware of the ultimate reality where the rising and ceasing uh, is happening. And uh, the conventional reality to me, it seems is, is very difficult to uh, is is very difficult to analyze things, but I I find the ultimate reality uh, easier related to the conventional reality. Yeah, pain is pain is ultimate reality, but uh, if you don't make pain you yourself, then that is wisdom. That is what is important to free yourself from suffering. Yes, uh, yes, that's what I was meaning. Yeah, correct. It can be really great dealing with people with humans who are suffering horribly. If if you have the opportunity to help to to um, connect them with mindful practice, at a point of my life, I myself was very suicidal, and I was suicidal for for a long period of time. I mean, not that long, but two or three months. And uh, uh, while I was suicidal, at that time, I really started uh, I li- really started uh, listening or reading about buddha and at that point i came to know about buddha and i started learning the dhamma and that was the turning point of my life that so from that point of view uh, now when i try to relate to that uh, i can relate that at, at that moment like right now i can think very logically or or everything but at that moment when i was myself very suicidal I was very emotional and uh, not like no logic. Uh, I I could not like uh, if um, like there was no sati in me at that uh, at that moment. I couldn't hold on to it. like there were like like millions of thoughts coming into my brain and uh, going from my brain and all these things. And at that uh, after, at that moment, that the only good things the good thing that happened that at that after that much suffering. I really, 
I, I really came to understand that it's not worth clinging to even to the suffering also. So after that, I, I really uh, like it, it was that moment when I started uh, learning the Dhamma. And even after, after starting, after I started, uh, after I started learning the Dhamma, even after that, there was a point came when I was suicidal for even one month or, or uh, that much period. And then I thought to myself, uh, I cannot kill myself. Like what, what I will do, what, what I will end up do is, end up doing is uh, I'll just change the body. And that's the thing. Like there is no killing and there is no birth. And like I, I was, I will just end up, uh, end up changing this body. And that is, that is of no use changing body. And I will have to go through the, uh, same procedure of, of of being a baby to being a teenage and to be this or like so at that at that point it just became to me it became like it's 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 kind of useless to uh, even think about like uh, after when I was when I was advanced in in Dhamma at that moment it was much easier for me to process uh, the suicidal thoughts or things like that and uh, right now. It it seems like for many days I haven't encountered this kind of thought. So, uh, so the learning learning dhamma and things like that really helped me um, to deal with this kind of thing. So, from my point of view, I can say that like from my first hand experience, uh, it it kind of seems to me like ill it, it it is aversion or ill will. To me, that it seems, but it's it's kind of it, it is. Uh, that sort of situation that uh, uh, I I had no no mindfulness no no ability to uh, to become even slightly mindful it, it was I was completely mindless and uh, I was always in my head thinking about this thinking about that uh, so uh, I think the slight uh, slight mindfulness can uh, can make a big change and one who is mindful uh, maybe uh, maybe this kind of pain and pleasure doesn't make a good uh, like it's not it's not a big deal to him that's what i have to say so, uh, it, it was one one thing you mentioned that we haven't really um discussed is uh, a, a reason why a lot of people a, a reason why a part of why both uh, euthanasia and suicide are so common has to be this um general belief in uh, cessation after death that killing the body is the end uh, so it is a solution it would be a solution if killing um, if killing was the end then for people whose life seems pointless it would be a solution but as you say once you learn buddhism you think well that would be useless <laughs> that wouldn't solve anything because there is something after. but um there was an in interesting and a very important uh, topic raised in the chat. Uh, Julie mentioned that, like, as young as 11 year old child contemplates about uh, ending them their lives. I mean, it even starts earlier. I think. I mean, um, it's it's still a hard topic in the sense, like, mm -hmm. when when children are in danger like they don't know what they are doing like um they don't really understand the dharma or even know about it yet and i mean i don't know about the solutions or anything it's just it's just heartbreaking to to see that um and i know myself as well my my friend's uh, child was um, apparently she was cutting herself throughout years so well it can be it can be yeah you hear stories of child abuse leading to such things so it can be even more complicated and awful when it's uh, there's reasons why they're cutting themselves i don't know how deep we want to go so, into that, whether we have limits on what we'll talk about here yeah so when you when you commit suicide if it, if it is more likely that you are going to be born in a hell whatever uh, painful experiences you are experiencing uh, with the human body could be like uh, you you would be experiencing like ten times that amount of pain in a hell. 
that would be a very dangerous uh, gamble. Well, I think what's more significant is the fact that you're dying without having resolved the aversion. And so at the moment of death, that's a big reason why you would go to hell or to a state of deprivation, a state of, of suffering, is because you're dying with without resolving anything, without being able to face it. And death is death forces you to face. You have no escape. At the moment of death, everything, every habit, every inclination of mind is is, is right there. Um, it, 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 you're freed from the body, so any uh, drugs or painkillers aren't going to help, aren't going to stand in the way of you facing whatever you're likely to react to. And so if you're if you're coming to that moment with great aversion and uh, and sensitivity, you're going to react, uh, which is why facing and I would think allowing the horrible experiences to play their to run their course is is actually more valuable. I mean, it's why we hear that sickness and death again are often great catalysts for enlightenment because they force you to face. Not always. Certainly, it's 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 a mixed bag, and the only real solution is prior prior training, and that makes it not a solution for most situations. For most situations, it's hopeless. There is no you you, just, you can't fix samsara. People die and go to hell and are traumatized, and yeah, that's samsara. Big soup. Um, Bhante, if you could please correct me if I say uh, anything like um that's filled with distortions. Um, which I'm sure there's going to be some part that's not correct. Um, but um, I wrote a comment earlier about, um, um, and it, it ties in with what you were saying about like letting things um, uh, run their course, um, because um, it seems like we might be interfering with something. Um, like sometimes we have thoughts of like what something is, but when we let things run their course, like it's not like we thought. Um, so like a, a concrete example in my life is um, my cat uh, was uh, very, very ill and uh, was diagnosed with a disease at the vet. And um, I was even like contemplating, oh my goodness, like what if I need to put the cat down because it was really suffering. And um, but... Um, Kill the cat. Um, I'm not, I'm not, you know, those, those euphemisms, it's call it what it is. Sorry. Maybe that's not sensitive, but it's not really fair to say, call it putting the cat down. Oh, okay. I see. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the correction. Um, so, uh, so I was seeking advice on what to do. So I did let it run its course and, um, and the cat is, is is well now so i didn't interfere um even i was giving it its medication and then um uh, i just slowly let the stop giving the medication and uh, everything's cleared right up so like we never know when we let things run their course like things can change in a different yeah, direction than we expected like the three characteristics that, is something that comes to mind that's what ajahn tong said i was just going to I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's what Ajahn Tong exactly said when this person was asking about euthanasia. He said, uh, you know, this happened with one one woman and she was very sick and just suffering terribly. And they decided not to uh, not to to ta to end her life. And and she recovered and she went on to live a, a, a many more years and did a lot of great things. And um, it's not really a great um, argument to 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 it's not shouldn't be the main argument, but it is eye opening and and I think what you said is is profound that things are not always as they seem that that is deeper than it may originally sa sound if you don't if you're not familiar with Buddhist practice it's kind of a theme in Buddhism is that things are not always what they seem and it can be seem very glaringly obvious um, and when you look closer it's actually more complicated. Uh, Bante, Moira mentioned something in the chat. I think it's interesting. Um, something interesting about suicide is how it is contagious. I read that someone is far more likely to commit suicide shortly after someone close to them has committed suicide. I, I've been wondering, is this, uh, or 
could this be maybe the reason when um, many members of a family actually commit suicide in generation, throughout generation? Well, again, I think it does speak to the, I mean, my guess is it speaks to the, the uh, belief in it being a solution. Like you commit suicide and that's the end. It's the ultimate, the, the eternal sleep. And it's, I mean, it just what makes it so seem like such an easy solution. But I mean, the only thing is that, well, attitudes are and behaviors are contagious. Monkey see, monkey do, as the saying goes. And the other thing is, of course, the tragedy of losing someone is just piles more grief on. And grief is a cause for contemplating suicide. So when someone you love kills. The other things could be religious reasons, like feeling like maybe you'll be with the person when when you die. And it's kind of perverse. but. You're not probably thinking straight when you're in great grief. I mean, losing a, someone close to you is just, for most people, devastating. Hard to think straight. But somebody that's committing suicide basically is uh, the w- wanting or the wishing of for the senses to see. Is that correct, right? Well, they don't know, but this is what they want because they had the wrong view that uh, after death there is nothing else. Or maybe I mean, there is head. It's so cut and dried. I mean, certainly some people will be like that. It's messy. And remember, most people aren't mindful and are acting on impulse or views. And it's, it's dependent on their culture. Sometimes culture plays a part in suicide. Lots of things. It's going to be dependent on the individual. There's probably patterns, I suppose. When I was suicidal, uh, once uh, I was searching uh, painless ways to die and then suddenly it hit me that if there is no aversion in me then why am i watching that painless way of die what's what's wrong with pain there there should be nothing wrong with pain and at that moment i realized that oh this is i'm completely in aversion or like this is uh, this is ever rising and uh, seizing so it it helped me a lot this 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 feel like for example um, uh, if someone someone commits suicide because of losing all the money, and uh, 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 and someone is not committing suicide, he's maybe homeless or maybe he's just renounced everything. So it also might depend on the perception. So wisdom plays a role, I think. Here, yeah, your descriptions show how uh, wisdom wisdom arises often in the in the darkest times when you are forced to go through these uh, through these uh, these challenges you, know, you have to ask yourself about or you have to notice things about yourself that you're averse to pain and so on that that most people who live cheery happy comfortable lives don't ever have to face or contemplate not to say some don't but some don't some do some don't <laughs> the buddha the buddha likened it to different kinds of Train training people who are trainable, different kind of uh, levels of maturity, ability to 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 evolve, to progress. Uh, some people have to really be hit with the worst of the worst before they realize something needs to be done. Other people, just knowing the potential is enough. Most of us, and and I think probably we would all in modern times be put in the the, the first category. <laughs> We're not we're not very well advanced that we can just grasp these things conceptually. We have to be faced with them before we before we start to ask the right questions. I just uh, wanted to say that um, both so uh, everyone was reading Kunda, but uh, it, his name was Mahachunda as well. Um, the letter C is always pronounced Cha. Cha. The ch the h doesn't add in Eng- as it does in english the cha sound the h adds an aspiration like it does with the t th is not pronounced th it's pronounced t kind of a t ch is pronounced ch as opposed to cha 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 mm-hmm. it's weird that he's mentioned uh, in the sutta but uh, i mean he doesn't really play much a big role here to find out oh i'm reading Mahachunda is, for instance, described in the Theragat as the younger brother of Sariputta. I didn't know that. 
there's there's more than one junda the um I'm not, I don't think it's this Junda, but I'm not sure now. One Junda is the one who went to the Buddha when the Buddha was ill, and the Buddha had him recite the Bojangas, and the Buddha's sickness disappeared because of the recitation. Oh. Okay, well, I have to go. That was great discussion, I hope. Uh, that was valuable for all, and for any improper speech, I apologize on my behalf, and forgiveness should be given all around. Hopefully it was valuable and there were good, I think there were many good things said. So thank you all for coming. Have a good week. Thank you, Bhante. 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 Thank you, Bhante.